Well, I guess I've been instructed that I'm not supposed to moderate, actually. That's right. So. We decided early on that we're not going to let him um, hide his light under that particular bushel. We were very pleased and honored that he agreed to do this um, and think of him as one of the participants in this conversation. So no moderation for you. <laughs> well, I've always thought that um, moderation in defense of, um, in, uh, defense of liberty is no... <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess somebody's got to kick it off. Is that going to be you, Barbara? Or? Well, I'll say a few words and then Karen's going to do a real kickoff. But I wanted to say, first of all, um, thanks very much to uh, everybody at the Brooklyn Museum who had a role in allowing us to do this here. This is a wonderful uh, space to be in. Um, and also, thanks to our to the staff and person who made it possible for us to do this, and especially thanks and appreciation to Adolf Reed. We, we, were, we, we pressed for him to be here, and we were honored and delighted when he agreed to do it, because Adolf Reed has been, certainly he's been a teacher to us, and in fact, he's been a teacher probably to everybody in this room. Some of you may not know it, because he's been at this work for such a long time that some of you have absorbed his ideas without even knowing where they came from. So um, he's, he's a teacher and progenitor, among many other things. And we're very pleased to be here. Um, this is a historic moment in that it is the second time in our careers that my sister and I have shared a platform. Um, the result of the fruit of well, the content of one of those presentations was a kind of script that's uh, chapter two of our book, Gracecraft, Individual Stories and Collective History. And we decided on that, the, um, we decided to keep the stage directions more or less so that we have it as a dialogue. This is the second time and, and we're in a conversation so we're going to operate in the same way, although we don't have a, real, uh, a script. So we decided to, uh, to uh, claim for ourselves the, or take the risk, as the case may be, of going back and forth as we have done for many, many years in the work we've done separately, uh, often, and coming together at periodic moments. So, uh, we've given ourselves freedom to correct each other, change, extend, and so forth, as we did plan ahead of time. But we want to have the informality of the exchange since this evening is called a conversation. Now, um, our subject, am I still supposed to keep going? Keep going till I interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> our subject is race craft you've seen our subtitle is the soul of inequality in American life and one of the reasons we're so thrilled to be with Adolph Reed this evening is that he's connected the general issue of inequality uh, and what he calls uh, the structured inequality of a particular political economy with issues that people shorthand as race um, and sometimes referred to as racism in some of their manifestations. Um, our purpose today is, and in the book, is to talk, uh, to advance to you a concept that we have developed over the years called racecraft for reasons that will come out shortly. Uh, so we'd like to start by identifying three things we expect to accomplish and what our, and our general thesis as we go throughout this uh, account of racecraft. And periodically, it's quite theoretical in places, but periodically we want to insert stories and sometimes read from the text so you can see what it is we're talking about and why, why we've been able to stay on this subject for as many years as we have. Now, 
Let's, let me start with the thesis, the abiding point we're making throughout. Barbara, correct me. We rehearsed this part today, and I kept <laughs> Each blowing. time we rehearsed it, it came out a little different. Yes. Most Americans assume that um, the perception of human difference gives rise to racism. We say most Americans have got it backwards. It is that racism gives rise to the perception of, of human difference. Because that we have to know who it is, who is the target of racism in the first place. So we want, we're doing that reversal. We're not going to be in the world of nature. We're going to be in the world of action. Uh, and now to the three points we want to make as we're going along the way, and three, uh, three sort of areas of discussion that we want to announce ahead of time so you can locate yourself, but we also uh, don't insist on going linearly. This is not inherently, these are not linear, uh, inherently linear phenomena. So there's one point, and Barbara get me because we also didn't, weren't clear all the time, which, which were the three. <laughs> We had a moment of panic on the subway. <laughs> what was number three? But <laughs> we were never in any, doubt, in any doubt that number one is that uh, the phenomena we're talking about are social in nature. Racism is a, a social practice. We are not talking about individual attitudes or in mental states of individuals. We're talking about social practice and we're talking about routine practice. And many of the stories we tell in the book give examples of it so you can see it wrong, uh, on the hoof in everyday life. If you need a shorthand for what racism is, it is the practice of a double standard based on ancestry. It's not a state of mind, not prejudice, not hatred, not any of those things. It's a practice together with the ideological uh, surroundings of that practice. Number two was racecraft is pervasive in everyday life. And partly because it's pervasive, it's also persuasive. That's 2A. And 2B is since we said pervasive, and for that reason persuasive, we insist that it involves everybody. Racecraft is not a cloud that stops and rains on people who are black or brown or whatever. It pervades US uh, society, it pervades daily life. Uh, the third thing we want to say is that Racecraft, as we're going to try to exhibit it to you, is intimately bound up with inequality in its other forms, including economics, and in fact, so tightly intertwined that, is, that the two are almost uh, inextricable from one another. And therefore, it's very hard to develop a politics against inequality without being headwinds from racism and very hard to have a, po have a politics against racism uh, that you can even hope will work without addressing inequality. So those are the three uh, points of our compass. We don't have four. We have three points of our compass that we want to start from. Um, so maybe we should start by explaining a little bit more what we mean by racecraft because for most of you, it's a new term. If you Googled it a few months ago, you would have gotten stuff that had to do with boat racing. Um, for those of you who don't take part in it or uh, uh, enjoy boat racing, the term probably will suggest to you witchcraft. And we meant it to suggest witchcraft. We chose it because it would suggest that analogy. But we meant it to suggest that analogy, not for the reason you might think at first. We don't regard it, or witchcraft either for that matter, as a simple superstition. Quite the contrary, both of them draw on the faculties of human reason. 
Otherwise, they could be the pervasive or persuasive. And they draw on it in analogous ways. Witchcraft and lacecraft, I'm almost quoting from the book now, are imagined, acted upon, and reimagined. The outcome is a belief that presents itself to the mind and imagination as a truth, a vivid truth. In societies where witchcraft prevails, it produces evidence for its existence in everyday material, the sort of misfortunes that happen to people in everyday life. Crops fail, a uh, woman miscarries, a man is impotent, uh, a person is the center of malicious gossip, sort of things that happen in everyday life. Um, and witchcraft comes out of those things and comes out of the effort to identify the culprits and, and punish them for it. Martin Luther, not talking about Martin Luther King, Martin Luther spoke in a matter-of-fact way about the devil mooning his window. Yes, mooning <laughs> his window, outside the window, outside the window showing his Never end. <laughs> Did you hear what he said? <laughs> Protestants. <laughs> he, he spoke about this as an everyday, matter of fact thing. The devil moved outside his window and he spoke of chasing away demons by farting on them. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, paying attention to the fact that, that this isn't, he wasn't delusional. He wasn't an outlier in his society. We argue in the book that witchcraft has no physical moving parts of its own and it doesn't need any. That's what we say in the introduction. It acquires moving parts that are perfectly adequate when a person acts upon the reality of it, as Martin Luther did. And by that route, witchcraft is constantly, uh, as we put it in the introduction, dumping factitious evidence of its existence into the real world. Every time you go after the witch, every time you notice, one of the things Luther says is that witches are able to steal milk from someone else's cow. They don't have to approach the cow to do it. They can use a handle or some other movement. Racecraft operates in that same way in the sense that once you act on the belief, that produces the evidence that's needed to sustain the belief. For us, just as for bygone believers and witches, daily life produces abundant evidence supporting a belief in race. Just think, for example, about all the things the media like to tabulate by race. Um, party perennials like teenage pregnancy, novelties like, here's one that Karen actually found on the book, under re disproportionate representation on Twitter by black people. <laughs> under representation among blood donors. So, like witchcraft, racecraft is constantly churning out these pieces of evidence. You see enough of those things tabulated by race, and pretty soon it's a real thing to you. It's probably a real thing to most of you in this room. Um, Sunday's New York Times actually dumped a new one, or rather, I should say, a, a fresh cameo appearance of one that is age old, namely the super sex black adolescent. That some of you saw the article that ran under the headline, quote, boys now enter puberty younger. How many saw that? <laughs> boys now enter puberty younger, study suggests, but it's unclear why. And the, art, the article, among many other things, uh, supplied the following factoid. Quote, the new study also found that African-American boys began puberty earlier than whites and Hispanics, a result that other studies have shown also applies to Afro-American, no, African-American girls. And by a stroke of racecraft, the researchers speculated, didn't offer any evidence, speculated, no evidence, 
that the difference, quote, is most likely driven by the role of genes in puberty. Now, the article made clear that even the basic finding, that is, that the onset of puberty is earlier, is spurious since they also admitted that there are no comparable data for the earlier period, so they can't even be sure what, the, the, if it's earlier, how much earlier, and so forth. So, all right, already the finding is spurious. Uh, the categories that the researchers used, if you read that article, are also genetically meaningless. African American, well that's bad enough, but what about white? What about Hispanic? Now I know there are people who think there's such a thing as a Hispanic genome, but I don't say they'll see the devil mooning outside their window, but they might as well. The study did not test factors that might affect the age of onset of puberty, such as weight and diet, environmental considerations, toxins in the environment, and so on. Uh, so where, is my question, where apart from race craft could the speculation have come from that uh, the difference is most likely driven by the role of genes in puberty? Racecraft, and as we uh, develop in some way in uh, the first chapter, second chapter of the book, uh, genes now share with blood the status of a metaphor for race. You don't believe me, you watch, just keep your eyes open for the way it's used in, in popular talk, and you'll see that the same way you can uh, speak of person's social belonging by blood. He's not this much African blood, this much uh, Native American blood. Genes are now standing in, in that way. I'm assuming at some point we're going to want to open this up yes. to have exchange. So um, it's 7.30 now. Oh, do we have, by the way, we have and we're going until 9, is that correct? Or we have until 9? Yeah, you guys have talked about it. Okay. All right, we, we, we didn't know when the carriage would turn into a point. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I guess, if I, well, well, I'll tell you one thing I was thinking about. I mean, I, I, I find a racecraft formulation very interesting and provocative and, of course, persuasive. Um, I like the witchcraft analogy also because they do function kind of the same way. And I guess, um, you know, one thing that prompted me to think about is, uh, well, to you know, lay that out uh, alongside what uh, the late, very obscure Chinese American Marxist Harry Chang, um, a way that Chang in the 1970s analogized race um, to Marxist characterization of the fetish character of money. Yeah. Right? Because they both work the same way, yes. right? I mean, uh, uh, but everyone knows that money, you know, big money isn't value. And gold money isn't value, but it stands in, it objectifies mm -hmm. right, value in the same way that race, and, and not just race, and I guess this is the other uh, nudge that I would push, push the race, race craft notion. Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not contrary to it at all, but I've been inclined to think of race as um, a species of the genus. Right, of um, discourses or um, ideologies of ascriptive hierarchy. Right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, um, and what, and what I mean by that is basically the same thing that you described with, with, uh, um, in uh, the definition of race, that, <coughs> pardon me, that, that is just an ideology of natural or essential difference based on what people supposedly are uh, instead of what they supposedly do. And um, what I'm wondering uh, is, is whether it, it might be that, that focusing on this genus also helps to open up the critique of race and racecraft. Uh, I say this especially from the standpoint of the early 21st century and kind of uh, looking back on the way that racial, racialist ideologies have evolved. And I mean, uh, who could not agree that, that, that you can't have um, race without racism, right? That, 
race is is the narrative of racism. But but at various points in the book, I've got to mark up that I won't reach from now. Uh, I, I mean, you guys know one or the other, or both know that you you do point to the genes, right? Uh, and in a sense, especially when uh, you write about feudal society, right? Uh, that because uh, um, well, what's at work here is um, naturalized or is ideologies of naturalized hierarchy mm -hmm. that equilibrate, and I know this sounds functionalist, and I guess it ultimately is, but that equilibrate um, social orders built on hierarchy by reading the hierarchies into nature uh, and race functions in, in that way in particular in capitalism in the West. And you know, I don't think we need to get into, you know, the, uh, I mean, as we all know, there's this level on uh, which people imagine there's, there's um, um, an abstract tension between the free and, or a free and, and emancipated tendency in capitalism yeah. and the reality of the hierarchy on which it depends. I think that's just a masturbatory, uh, you know, self-congratulation, basically. It's, uh, this, there's never been a commitment to Capitalism to human emancipation for anybody other than the bourgeoisie, and and the rest of us is always you know, always counted as basically the same thing. But the reason that I wonder that, like, I'm gonna shut up in a moment. But the reason I wonder um, that uh, that focusing on the genus would also be useful is that we are at a point now, as we have been at the different points in the last 120 years, where um, race, like, well, I have two thoughts competing for a space in this very small compartment in my head. Somebody has to win. Let me see if I can get one out first. Um, you want both of them. <laughs> well, I'll try to do them one at a time. Uh, two points. One is that the period, from, as you guys know too, from roughly the last quarter of the 19th century through the first third of the 20th century is the apogee of the race idea and like the history of the world, right? It's more powerful, more, cons more deeply consensually understood to shape destiny, to explain whatever you want to explain, to do this work of race work than at any point prior to then or since then. And one of the reasons that it's that, become, that its power has waned is the sort of disenchantment of the witchcraft component of, um, of race as an ideology, of the practice of, of, of the racecraft. Not its defeat by any means, but disenchantment to the extent that struggles um, against it have kind of problematized it in a way. And I think that this genus uh, of, 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 of ascriptive ideologies works best as a folk discourse, right? Which is the point about uh, you know, the link to witchcraft. But to the extent that uh, egalitarian forces have challenged them successfully, or challenged official race discourse successfully, and I'll clarify that in a moment too, uh, you can't find anybody really who self-declares as a racist, or at least not outside Idaho. Um, outside of where? Uh, the state of Idaho. No, that's not true. Uh, but, um, <laughs> everywhere. Well, no, but who self-declares that? <laughs> right, that's one, right? So, so that we find ourselves with, um, facing, uh, you know, Glenn Beck, for instance, um, trying to appropriate uh, you know, Martin Luther King, Jr. I don't know if seen but I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. and accusing Barack Obama of being a racist, just as Anne, Anne Coulter and Sarah Palin have accused the Democrats of being sexist, right? So I mean, that's just that, that's just kind of, uh, and this is another tension that that I think you guys grapple with is um, how to characterize uh, practice and discursive practices, right, that presume the full understanding of naturalized difference that more or less lines up with the, with a, the familiar 
race taxon. Yeah, I think that's, it. I, I carry that even further to say that uh, the more people become familiar with what is supposed to be a scientific language to talk about these things, the more they align it with the folk categories. So genes become blood. Right, and, right. And right. Uh, genetic, notice how often when a, a journalist uh, speak of something that's genetic, that's a synonym for them, right. racial. Right, so here's the problem though. Right. And I think this is the problem that we're going to be facing more and more and more. Uh, that in, in, in these latter day versions of phrenology, right, uh, and eugenics, uh, there's more and more um, scrupulous effort, or at least fastidious effort, on the part of uh, the scholars to uh, make clear that they are dis that 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 they're dissociating the determinist claim that they're making from the familiar three to five Noah um, originated race, race types, right? Uh, and, and what happens is that to the extent that racism, non-racism, it becomes an axis um, according to which we debate the determinist ideologies, they kind of win. Right, uh, right, because it's possible to imagine, you know, like an underclass that can be disproportionately black and Latino, but that doesn't map so closely on, onto it that it would appear to be just uh, the old racism that's uh, mm -hmm. you know, repackaged, and it could include other populations. It, it, it could include some of these other biodeterminist categories and make it come back like a natural born criminal. Uh, uh, I guess they haven't discovered the gene for investment yet. But. <laughs> because plenty of evidence for it has been churned into everyday life. You would think that there is an endowment by the creator of some of these people well, of an embezzlement and criminality gene. I call them at one point uh, virtual souls of thievery who through all of this, through all the time that the criminal gene was being uh, looked for and Joshua was taken in penitentiaries in the 1980s, the rest of the people were out there stealing right and left. Big scale, going nowhere, completely outside, not only outside the penitentiary, but outside the genetic study of dysfunction. And so there's an issue of the language we, uh, the language we use that only takes over part of the world part of the time, which is why we insist on pervasive and persuasive, and we want to carry the lot if there's a genetics of criminality, and sitting up in an undergraduate class and don't know much yet, and they start taking about, talking about people from inner city this and that, Hand should go up and say, Professor, before I'm out of the class this semester, I want you to tell me how that applies to these people who are still walking in the street and who stole us blind. All right? Pervasive. If there's a theory that explains, if criminality is explained by genetic endowment, and we will at least formally agree that some kinds of financial, what's the word, uh, euphemism that's used? Genius. <laughs> Border on the criminal. Then we ought, the genetic uh, swab should be put into more jobs. I mean, the research swab should be put into more jobs. Let's make sure that all of the places where we could be looking for the genetic causation of behavior uh, are to be found. And there's a list of that. There's mass murder. There's, um, there's all sorts of things. But racecraft says, oh, it's got to do with race. Let's start with the people who are putatively differently constituted because it's uh, genetically in every other way because they have dark skin. Well, let's, let's, let's not say that if something is pervasive, uh, and persuasive to everybody that it's only to be seen in some a part of the society part of the time. So
So that's what I have to say on that. And other point I want to make in response to uh, uh, Adolf is that yes, we have science has stepped back it, from its 19th century pretensions, but it is making large step forward, steps forward in 21st century uh, work and, and late 20th century work that assumes the validity of the general way of thinking that those 19th century people brought. And I'm going to bring this down to a story um, because uh, everybody should know about the life of a book when it's becoming oppressive, uh, when it's becoming a monkey on your back and you can't get away from your subject. That's the time when your subject really comes after you. Now, summer of 2010, I was minding my business in my own place, having just uh, written part of what became a tour of racecraft. That's chapter one of the book. And I had talked about uh, the uh, blood as an element of the Nazi theorizing, and blood as part of the dis the disputes about segregation, the labeling of blood. And in the, uh, 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 during World War II, uh, and the outrage that we had in, the, in an emergency, the collection of blood and storage of blood involved Jim Crow rituals, keeping the blood in separate refrigerators from different uh, donors, keeping the blood on separate shelves of refrigerators, having separate days for donors to come, uh, processing plasma in different batches, on down the line, it was like it was quasi-religious and its attention to details of keeping things separate. When everybody knew, according to the science even then, that human blood is basically the same, and uh, there, there's no justification for that. The army said there, it's psychologically important to learn, even though there's no credible biological basis. Okay, so I had worked through all of that, and then I, minding my own business, I went to the door, and here was a piece of mail from the Georgia Red Cross, August 2010, uh, addressed to people like my daughter who were attending colleges in the Atlanta University Center. And it invited students to come and donate blood in the upcoming Sickle Cell Anemia Awareness Month because African Americans have the best chance of survival. Best chance of survival is their language if they receive blood from other African Americans. And I thought I would faint. I thought this was gone. So I went to, I, I called up my sister, I talked to my daughter, who's a biology person, and we all had our hair standing on it, and beyond what it usually does. And I wrote to the Red Cross headquarters and said, what is going on? What is your scientific basis for this? And folks, they had a scientific basis. They had a 1990 paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and they had a 2008 journal uh, article published in the Journal of Transfusion, where uh, that's where I got the racial disparity in blood donor, <laughs> one of the things. But the word from the, uh, from uh, the New England Journal of Medicine argued a cure, made a curious case that people survived. And so we looked into it closely to see what happened to the science. You want to take it from there? Little did I know that my daughter, I mean my sister, had seen this story as a Times article in 1992 when it was first published. They're sending this two decades old paper in 2010, to me, my daughter said, well, we laugh at people who, who in science, when people send antiquated papers, we know something is up. But anyway, go ahead. 
Barbara Bell, uh, those in this audience who are my students will recognize this episode because I've been using it in my annual, I call it, Invention of Race Lecture. Uh, because what's curious is once you look at the evidence they have, they don't have any evidence. But they found out that uh, they claimed that, uh, uh, I don't think they said black, no African-American recipients of blood donations from white people um, were likely to show, to develop antibodies to certain antigens in this white blood. But as soon as you start examining it, you find out that uh, two-thirds of their sample didn't have that. Didn't have that reaction. So the way I used to put it to my students was they're, they, they're, they're looking at a population of Afro-Americans of whom a minority have sickle cell trait. And out of that, a minority have sickle cell anemia. And out of that minority, we receive transfusions, a minority uh, show the development of these antibodies. So I said, they're talking about a minority of a minority of a minority showing these traits, and then they call it a racial characteristic. The best you can say is that it's, it is an uncharacteristic. But what we found when we went back to the New England Journal of, of Medicine and looked more closely, we found that in some of the commentaries on the article, they have already been told by people who went back through the data, this doesn't work. And if you actually rework your, your data appropriate, appropriately, you'll find that what you're seeing is uh, uh, the, the uh, standard effect of mismatching, not racial mismatching, just mismatching. Uh, and they, they didn't back up. They're sending it out, what is it, 20 years later? And, and they still think it means something. They think it means something because it has to mean something. That is one of the points we're making about race prep. Ultimately, it doesn't matter so much whether they can prove what they're claiming there, because blood matters even if you can't prove that it matters, because blood is one of the indicators of race. Pushing uh, a California state initiative called the California Civil Rights Initiative, oh, yeah. uh, right, that would have prohibited uh, the state of California from gathering data by, by race. And I've read about this and, and heard about it for a while. I thought, oh, God, this is stupid. This war Connolly. What the hell? But then I found out that um, th there were two exceptions. Uh, one was law enforcement, and the other was medical research. And that was a stone. I thought, all right, so you could not design a more precisely targeted, ass backward drone of ignorance, right, and reaction than, than this. So I thought, that as my civic duty, I would gear up to draft an op-ed piece to send to, to, you know, to the San Francisco Chronicle or the LA Times and Sacramento Bee or somebody. But I figured I could check first, being a political person, uh, to make sure I didn't say anything that, that cut against the uh, um, anti-CCRI campaign. And I was blown away. I was stunned, speechless, and demoralized when I went to the opposition website and the public health link, and saw it was all about how if this thing passes, we won't be able to get funding for the diseases that we get. Well, so that eventually prompted what turned out to be an article instead of an op-ed, Jason. Some of you know that I have a history of doing that. But, um, but what was striking about this, though, was from digging in, into the field, uh, I came across a couple things. One problem is it's very prosaic, right? That there's a simple garbage in, garbage out yes. problem because data are collected in the public health area are collected by race but not really by, by, by class. And I'll come back in a second to what I mean by really in this context. Uh, and people do it mindlessly. Uh, and uh, in fact, I think it was Don Comstock uh, uh, who might be able to, 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 uh, to refresh me, Merlin. But uh, somebody did a study of I think uh, 10 years or a thousand articles in uh, the American Journal of Public Health and I think Jenna that examined uh, the use of race 
um, as um, a cap or reference to race as, as categories for sorting data. And found it's very, very common to use, but but only about a quarter of the time that they figure into findings or or even less frequently in conclusions. But there's there's another um, dynamic that's at work, and that has to do with, and this is what I mean by the real, that what what's, also, what's often found, what's also found in the studies of this work that sort of controls for class is the controls are preposterous. And I mean, maybe the most preposterous one of them all, which I guess fits, uh, is um, uh, a study that um, led to um, the, um, the FDA's authorization of the first ra race targeted drug in the, in the history of the FDA, Biden, which is the brainchild or the or the love child, I guess. Uh, love the child. Right, 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 the love child of uh, the pharmaceutical industry and the Association of Black Cardiologists. Um, um, uh, because this is a study that purported to find that this drug that hadn't been effective in general use and, uh, and, what, and what was about to uh, exhaust uh, the R&D costs, magically it was found to work as a blood thinner for black men. They say, well, how can it work on, on, on the physiology of black men when there is no such thing as the, as, as the physiology of black men? But that takes us back to the racecraft and the witchcraft. And then when you look at the study, uh, I forget how big the sample was, it wasn't huge, but it was an all-black sample, so that there were no non-black people. And the control for class was a um, response to two questions. How many years of schooling have, have you had? And how do you feel about your prospects in, in life? So, so, so as always, right, I mean, it, you see, this, says, this, this points to something else, right, like the changing valence of the relation between race and political economy. Right? But because we've also seen, as part of the successful challenge from uh, underneath, um, over the last half century plus, uh, two-thirds century, the gradual emergence and more than gradual after in the 1960s of, of you know, multi-billion dollar political economy of race relations. Right? Uh, and the people, so, um, Merlin Chao, Chao Panyan was in the audience who, who were already embarrassed you know, uh, a moment ago. And I have done some work and are uh, involved in, in, in a bigger project that examines the racial disparities uh, in a scholarship because we're trying to figure out, well, you know, the disparity studies keep finding the disparity. Uh, Often enough, you know, the disparities are not at all surprising. I mean, is there anybody in, in the room, for instance, who who was genuinely surprised to learn that um, that um, the economic impact of the downturn was greater on people who were classified as black or Hispanic than it was on people who who were classified as white? Is there anybody in the room who was surprised? to learn that about stop and frisk, about drug enforcement, about housing disparities, about you know, anything else. And then you have to ask, well, if the finding is always the same, and if you already know what the finding is before it's found, and, as, and I admit that, that what we do in, in the social sciences is go find what we're looking for. Uh, so if you want a unicorn, you find that kind of thing. Um, but, so our question is, what, what's going on? What, what's actually driving this? What do people imagine that they're doing when they're doing this and announce uh, with that kind of uh, look of particular satisfaction that quantitatively trained academics get when, when they produce the mind? But I'm sorry, I had to give you an anecdote. And I'll shut up after the anecdote. But in, in the spring of 1985, um, I was at a one-day meeting at the Joint Center for, for Political Studies, a post-mortem on the 1984 presidential election. 
And the National Election Survey at the uh, University of Michigan had just opened up this black sample, right? this, uh, this special black sample. And these two guys from uh, Michigan gave a paper drawn from, from, from that black, from analysis of that black sample. And uh, I swear, this is no exaggeration. I can produce some witnesses if, if I had to. But it was a 25-page paper, the first 23 and a half pages of which were about the regressions that they ran and why they ran them, and the regressions that they didn't run and why they didn't run. And then there was either a half page of findings and a page of conclusion or, or the other way around. And the punchline of which was that this guy looked up with that look on his face that I described a minute ago and said that the only solid explanation they could find for black American support of Jesse Jackson in the primaries in 1984 was a combination, a combination of strong positive affect toward Jackson and strong negative affect toward Mondi. <laughs> and the discussion on the paper was, um, it was a political scientist, a woman, a friend of mine who died a few years ago, named um, Linda Faye Williams, from Love Lady, Texas, and she had that kind of Texas draw. She you know, began her, her comment by saying, you know, this paper reminds me of the punchline of, of the punchline that old joke, what's the social scientist? It's that, you know, the, the, the punchline is a social scientist is somebody who spent a hundred thousand dollar research grant from NSF to find out where the courthouse is in town and all they had to do is ask the cab driver. <laughs> but the disparity but 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 there's something else else is going on there and as I promised I'll shut up. But I think that what the disparity um, what the disparity industry points to is the extent to which it's, it, it is now possible for race to become, and, and racial ideology, which is really what, what, what race is, to become a form of capital for people who are able to operate under the label, right? Um, yeah, that's apparently the problem was that patent was about to expire. If they didn't find uh, or claim to have found a new use for it, they could now have a new patent and then set the clock starts back. Um, and we just only have, um, sarcastically, we uh, to compare this in the book to uh, the, the protocols that a group of prisoners arrived at for the sale of illegal drugs inside the prison. And uh, they established that uh, uh, how many groups were there? Five? There were five groups. There were five groups, and so uh, you have the... Um, the woods are the Tekka woods. They sell by the white people. <laughs> the Razas, who are uh, native born and born in the in, uh, United States by the Mexican descent. The Paisas were Mexican. Mexican. I've forgotten who the fifth is. Maybe there were just four. Maybe four, but there were two groups of woods. One were skin, one was skinheads, and the other was Aryan nation. And so we are, we have a place in there where we talk about how they negotiate, they, how they have created through an elaborate uh, the uh, rules of who can do what with whom, a microcosm of society outside suited to the means inside. So you can only sell drugs to your own group. Yes, point. And the cheaper and better ones supposedly came from the Paisas and the Lazas. But the, since they can't go to court, they can't sue, the uh, compulsory part comes from a beat down or a murder in prison. But this is throughout, it's a very fascinating story told by a Jewish person who found himself uh, in, a, in a, back, a penitentiary in Illinois, uh, who had no place to sit in the, in the child hall. And he was going to lose his life if he didn't figure out. You're not out supposed to sit in the wrong place, in other words. And he didn't know what was the right place. He didn't have a right place to sit if he wasn't in, uh, with the Aryan nation or the, uh, what I call the skinheads. That wouldn't do. And he talks about their theory about Jews. And then certainly, 
the uh, black people would have gotten in trouble. The, uh, the, um, the uh, kid folks would have thought, this is just about a white person. He doesn't belong here, not knowing that this guy is not considered a white person. It was in, if, uh, read the section, it's quite fascinating. But the end of it is that they created monopolies that, uh, that are race-based, that, that are profitable markets that generate economic rents to those groups according to the monopoly. And the guy goes on to explain the tattoo parlors are organized in the same way. They have a microcosm of the society outside. Uh, they have uh, vehicles of enforcement different. You don't stand in the corner if you break the segregation rules. You're, you can risk your life. That was published in the year 2000. Eight uh, thereabouts. Yeah, so that's been happening here. It's not quite that they take what they find in the larger society because they have to make this up. That's what you see going on. They have to make it up, although they may tell themselves in their minds that it was already there, but they had to devise it. Here's a Jewish guy who is told finally, um, all right, you can sit at the uh, white people's table, one of the white people's table. You know, the after the white people have, after they have finished eating. Sounds like South Carolina in 19 for a privileged member of a, of an group. But I, I have to go back a little bit about the marketing of drugs and, and the industry of it. I actually meant to bring a prop today, and several times this morning I told myself, don't forget to take the prop. And I forgot it. But it, it's a carton in which I bought um, a, a bottle of Citracal, which is a type of calcium supplement that my doctor ordered me to take um, some years ago. And I, I didn't obey the order for very long. But I've saved the box because the back of the box says that this is meant for white and Asian women to guard against their risk for osteoporosis. And I thought, well, what are you doing with your Afro-American self? <laughs> <laughs> but then I thought, well, what kind of marketing is this? Where they put it on the box to tell me, don't buy it. <laughs> it's not just marketing, though. It's people believe it. And one point I don't want to fail to make is that uh, we deem the stories we tell the down really, really detailed stories uh, to be important because they show us where to look for racecraft when it's going on. One of the ways to defeat um, a pestilence is sunshine and awareness. And one of the ways to perpetuate it uh, is to allow it to, to, be, uh, in the to be in the shadows. And when it's in the shadows, meaning the place where black people are, <laughs> everybody else can say it's, it's pervasive among them. them. It doesn't pervade the whole society. And it's only their responsibility to fix whatever causes the consequences to, of racecraft to fall on them. It is important to document what happens in everyday life. And so we spent a lot of time finding stories, and then as I told you, the dam's broken, and we couldn't keep up with the number of stories after a while. Yeah, but perhaps we should share a couple of them before we end. Well, maybe we can bring them up, because I think we should let the audience yeah. in. Yeah. That's it. Questions, comments? I was wondering whether we could move to the second topic before we have questions. What do you think is the second topic? Any three, were there three topics you're going to tell you? I said there are three parts. We weren't doing, I said they were going to, we couldn't do them linearly because okay. they're interrelated, but I wanted you to notice okay. that each one is going, we give, gave least attention to inequality in the nitty gritty sense, and maybe we should tell that story. Well, I, well and I have, a, before we get to, there, there's a, an illustrative story, but um, I wanted to say that in everyday American usage, when people talk about race, they think it's something that you find in and around black people, or else in certain circumstances, it's um, Afro-Latinos or American Indians. 
The illusion of, of racecraft actually moves white people off stage into those shadows that my sister's talking about. Whenever race is on stage with a speaking part, that is what makes racecraft such a potent support for class inequality. It's just the fact that it creates that, that uh, shadow. Because racecraft tars working people across the board with the brush that racism uses for black people and Latinos. And by doing so, it provides, in a way, an argument in support of inequality that is more potent because it's not spoken, because it's, in, it's tacit and it's in the shadows. A British journalist who was covering the primaries of last spring gave an illustration of how it worked um, when a, a, a Republican candidate spoke of um, dismissed food stamps as giving black people somebody else's money. And he got applause from an audience in Sioux City, Iowa, where uh, in a county where there are nine times as many white as black users of food stamps. So the people doing the applauding, some of them had to be people who were using food stamps, but they couldn't actually see themselves as, as implicated, but they did see the argument. So inequality has, has gotten a big support from these people who are suffering from it and can't even see how it's working in their instance. Another case, and this one we cite in the book, uh, a white electrician in Martinsville, Ohio, held food stamp users in contempt. He no doubt visualized them as Afro-American. In such contempt that he was ashamed to tell his parents that he needed to use food stamps. Now, why did he need it? It was after the crash, the recession. He still had a job, but his overtime had been cut so much that he didn't have enough money to support four children and his wife. Um, the fact that his own family had that sort of need did not soften his contempt, though. And he was traveling around with a, with a journalist, and, uh, and they looked out the window, and they saw crowds of people at midnight who uh, were using their food stamps that had just been re-upped, and so they were using them to shop. And he pointed them out with contempt, and he said, you know, when you see people out in the street like this at this hour, um, what are they into? He was out in the street at that hour. And he didn't think he was into anything unsavory, but they had to be into something unsavory. So the point is, racism tagged those midnight shoppers as people who were into something uh, because they were out of work. Racecraft concealed from him the truth that he and those midnight shoppers were under the same regime of inequality. I want to say that part of the book is especially strong, I think. Uh, I got a moderator type, type, type question for you. And this might be a nice way to... Uh, yeah, the audience. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, um, I know. Uh, I mean, I know you, and I know I, and you, you at least by um, the implication, are all bitter foes and intransigent foes of the notion of whiteness and what whiteness studies. So I'm wondering uh, how... I mean, I think I know the answer, but, uh, or I mean, I know answers, but how would you um, square um, what some people might think is, is a contradiction between uh, the contention that, or the complaint, really, and it's a justified complaint, that race or, or, or folk racialization is directed toward the non-white victims with the objection to um, the um, whiteness pattern. Can I give a really short answer? It's not, and my sister quoted somebody to this effect. I know the argument you're talking about. Um, and I know how far it can go, but there is one person who said recently, you're going to tell me who the person quoted recently said, that I realized, I, of a woman was quoted as saying, I realize I go through much of my life not really having to think of myself as white. And then I realized what a liberation I enjoy by comparison with other people she was talking to. 
And you see, what's, what's deep about that is that she, had, if she had not engaged in the, polit made the political engagement or commitment she had done, she would never have had to know that she was white or feel, uh, or, or feel that she had, that there was anything particular about it. It's through engagement with other people that she said, my God, the biggest, the, there are many privileges associated with being white, but one of them is not to have to constantly think of what you look like to other people. And I think that's the, the biggest one, and the whiteness is a false equivalence in a word. I wouldn't like to spell many words, so I'm like, oh. <laughs> I happen to work in the, uh, between 1996 and 2006, on a documentary film called Shared History in collaboration with a descendant of, of slaveholders in South Carolina. Some of you may know we are from South Carolina. And her plant, family's plantation uh, backed up on Lemon Swamp, which was the place our grandmother's father came from. We knew about Lemon Swamp, that was an area. So she and I worked together and Boy, it was not simple, and it, uh, and it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a story to say, how could we tell a shared history about South Carolina? Because there are disparate stories passed down. But how can we not tell? We have to tell. It's obligatory to tell it since people have been sitting side by side for two and a half centuries in South Carolina. It's necessary. We have to figure out how to do it. And so we worked through that problem. You can see the film uh, if you want, but a week ago, two weeks ago, we went together to South Carolina to a condo in a gay community looking out over the sea. And we're good friends now, but, I, but we did it self-consciously because I wanted her to see it, uh, me negotiating a dangerous space. And uh, I wanted to see her, how she managed to dispel the problem of having somebody like me in tow. And, and, and it, was, it was quite something. Uh, she kept saying, look, I don't want to go in the pool. Think of what the pool means in the South. I don't want, she said, I don't want to go in the pool. I want to walk along the seafront. You go in the pool. I said, but I'm not going in the pool by myself. <laughs> but that can't help like that. I said, I'm afraid of being thrown out or insulted or assaulted. And I just can't do it. Bring your white self in there with me. <laughs> Use your steel magnolia twain on those people. <laughs> So that she came down, she was almost six feet tall. Her name is one of those South Carolina names I might as well tell you. She won't mind. She might, we're always interested in publicity. It's Felicia de Saucia. They were Huguenots and they say Desi so. And Furman, the name Furman of the University. So this woman said, well, we, we're just going to get down here and see what it all is. And so we went, she came to the pool, and we saw there were people inhabiting the pool, and we broke into conversation with them, and it, it produced a world. And we, after a while, we really, I saw that they didn't bite, and she saw she didn't need to be there as a protector, so she took her walk, and I sat in a jacuzzi with this couple, and talked for about an hour, and she came back, and then we shared the social experiment we had been doing, and they were fascinated. And I, we said, well, a new South Carolina is possible. It is, is possible. And it's frightening, and it's legitimately, I mean, everybody understands what the symbolic meaning of a pool is, and everybody knows how dangerous a gay community can be at this point. And I said, hey, friend, I, your place frightens me. <laughs> so
So that was it. We got it and we decided that we're going to try to write together about this conversation we've been trying to have about the real world. Mm -hmm. And the background, um, a background to that, is a story that we tell in this draft about another story um, into which a group, uh, a, a mixed group of children from a, a day camp entered uh, at a country club outside Philadelphia, outside Philadelphia, it's not South Carolina, and it led to an instant exodus of the white children in tow of their mothers. And this was like 2005. Four years ago. 2009, June 2009. Question to you. I'm sorry about the obvious situation earlier, but I wanted to ask about this reversal of your thesis. Uh, so now we're saying that racism gives rise to questioning the differences between race. And I've never actually heard something like that. And um, you find racism as a double standard. And Based on ancestry. Yes. I um, but I want to know where does that actual racism derive? We're not saying that it is derived from the question of It derives, where, if not from the differences? Yes. Well, I have, uh, there are a couple of stories that are very uh, illustrative. Maybe I should tell the story about the Kaiman. Should I? You can tell me. You can tell me. tell me. You can tell me. You can tell me. Hmm? Tell the couple. Okay. <laughs> Take it a distance, a distance away. There's a travel story, uh, a travel book published in 2007 uh, about somebody who toured southwestern France and who it was reviewed in the nation. I know about it through that review. And the person in southwestern France had lots and lots of churches. And this person had been struck by the fact that there were these teensy doors on the side of churches often. What was up with that? And the, uh, the author found that these doors were constructed for a despised people, despised since the Middle Ages, called the Catholic, C-H-E-O-T-S. And the reviewer became fascinated with the Catholic. Well, they have to enter the church by a definite entr entrance that's small, not because they were small, but because they had to bow down before they could stand up. They had to accept communion from the end of a long stick. They had to uh, sit in a designated part of the church. They were prohibited uh, to marry outside their group. Uh, they could not go barefoot. They could not draw water at the same wells as everybody else. I thought water fountains, but there we are. In other words, we have something that and they had to wear um, a, 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 an insignia that identified them. And often it was a goose's foot. So you could see the dried up foot. Maybe there was a characteristic smell as well. Now I said to myself, these are traits. These are traits of ritual conduct in segregated society that sound like the U.S. South in the 20th century. Wow, I was amazed. And then the reviewer went on to say, we don't know much about the Catgo. They have disappeared now. She said, the, myster the mystery of the Catgo is that they have no distinguishing features. And I said, my God, she has illustrated our thesis in racecraft. The Kago had no distinguishing features. That's why they had to wear the goose foot. That's why they had to sit apart. That's why all those other things existed. Otherwise, you wouldn't know who was Kugo, Kago and who was not. But the thing I want to say to you is that 
they knew how to do it in Europe. And again, this is where we're talking about the Middle Ages. Long before they could stand a back, a difference, physical difference, different treatment, different rules, differentiating rituals. They did with that where everybody looked more or less alike down the ages in Europe. And so when it started happening to black people, it's not because they were black, and indeed it wasn't enough that they were black. They did the same rituals of, of separation. So you see, we don't need that. That is part of the illusion. And a part of the illusion in teaching about this is that Americans think there always has to be physical difference, like that pathetic reviewer. All the evidence was in her face that different, uh, different physical difference doesn't exist. Uh, is, it, is it necessary? It might exist. But it isn't necessary to have racist uh, phenomena on the foot. You want to know how the cat goes escape their situation? Just to add to that, to, okay. to invoke barber fields, and I won't um, try to reproduce the experiment because I always mess it up, but the punchline in the experiment is this, that human populations differ, I mean human beings, right, human uh, um, individuals differ in many, many ways, height, hair color, body build, right, uh, and, but we, and this goes back to the full character of, of, of this, racism, we, we know that racism exists because we know that racism exists, and we know that racism exists because it's part of our folk reality, right, so in that sense, uh, and, you know, uh, I mean, some circles, thank God I'm not in Chicago on the south side because we could probably get strung up for this. But um, it was enslavement that made black people, not that black people were made, made to be slaves. Yes. <coughs> um, I would like to go back to the issue of disparity, which uh, was raised during the conversation. And the reason I want to do that is because uh, for as valuable as the conceptual framework of racecraft is, in the comparison to witchcraft, I also think it has its limits. And it comes from one of the comments that was made about shining light on the everyday, say, aspect of how race operates. I think there's value in that. There's no question about that. In fact, we can probably call the, the audience, we can probably find some examples that we could do. However, I think that when when you start to think about a political project, right, particularly political for the left, what? political project for the left, in terms of keeping in mind that racecraft operates, right, on the everyday lives of people, how do we build, how do we craft a political movement that will not only shine light on it, but also talk about the political economy of racism, where it stems from, and what we need to do in terms of organizing. You can speak to that. They lost the best one to speak to that. <laughs> um, well, God help us then. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't help us. If I can, I can say something. Okay, good. All right. Um, and I think I learned this from you. I reread class notes uh, the past few days. That there has to be um, a sense of who all is concerned with disparities. And who all, because that's the who all, who have to move the politics. And I think that the, the depiction of racecraft as pervasive and encompassing creates a way of posing things that happen in such a way that they allow people who could not ordinarily be in conversation about their practical requirements in today's conjuncture could have that conversation. A sort of the territory uh, I was on with my friend, the descendant of the slaveholder, the conditions under which we can have a conversation require awareness of the things that prevent us from having a conversation. The conditions that make it possible for a man to be on a food stamps and think it's a racial thing are conditions that are, that are politically consequential, because he's in the same boat. But, that's, uh, but 
we can address the politics where it needs to be a, a, a way of talk of getting people together who would not otherwise be if we're talking about not theory but a concrete project to get this or that necessary thing done in which everybody has an interest. And I think, I can imagine, I don't know that, whether that was a total knucklehead or not, the, the electrician, but somebody who said, look, we have to, this company that cut my hours offshore my jobs. We have to sit here and deal with that issue all those people who are concerned. And it may not be able to be taken up that way, it may have to be taken up with, they treat us with so much disrespect when we go to get our food stamps, it's disgusting, we're all Americans. And find ways to uh, identify what's common about the experience because we all understand and speak race craft very well in the United States. We, in fact, canvassing in my neighborhood in Virginia, we figured out how to go to the white neighborhoods where people are Republican against their own interests and at least start talking to them, show up there. And uh, so I think there's, it's relevant, we don't have a public language that's legitimate for talking about inequality. And we have to take up the space of that absence. And otherwise, it would constantly be identified with the shiftless people versus the hardworking white people. See what I'm saying? It, I hope it doesn't sound dreamlike, but um, it is about speaking. We speak, we share a common language of English, most of us. We also have a common experience which we can speak of more clearly if we understand what mobilizes it. And that's why we use so many examples. Because uh, not everybody, even those scientists who do that nonsense, I think will begin to pause if an undergraduate has read racecraft and sees that table that has a list of, um, uh, here's the numbers for the black population, and here are the numbers for the non-black population. I've seen that in 2012 this year. Statistics that are of biological relevance done on black and non-black as a comparison. If somebody, I think I'm saying that people a lot are used to getting away scot-free with that and being paid up in public projects to do that reactionary research. We, if we can get students who will stand up and say, what's non-black? Yeah, but do you have, have you, have you cast the genome, the non-black genome? <laughs> well, listen, I asked a question at Duke University in the demography seminar, and people stopped in their tracks. And then they began to talk in tongues, as my father said. You <laughs> couldn't understand, you could hear them talking, but you couldn't understand what they're saying. They're so used to non-black that they don't see what's weird about it. And actually, when I went back to that article that was in the New England Journal of Medicine, they too had a sample of non-blacks. So this is this has been slithering along on the back side of our of our life. And it needs to be we need air on it so we can begin to have a politics that takes into account into account the whole reality. Yeah, just I think it's absolutely on, on, on target. The only thing I would add is that and it's also linked to South Carolina, which reminds me I have a South Carolina question for you guys after that. But um, yeah, I spent like two or three years in the middle part of the last decade, um, pretty much an organizing project um, you know, down there. And I was struck. Among the things that struck me is that you know, when you talk to working people out um, about in context that aren't supposed to be about politics, which means partisan politics. Um, what, what you find is that you know, working people pretty much express concerns about the same stuff. And they don't even ask about you know, the, the so-called hot question button issues that are supposed to divide blacks and whites. And when we started down there, it was like a couple of years after, the, two or three years after the, big, the last flag controversy. Um, and what I learned was that because the component of this was um, trying, trying to think about creating an electoral alternative was that the Democratic Party of South Carolina um, 
doesn't authorize black people to run in districts that are between 40 and 65 percent black. Those are defined as black interest districts. Black candidate districts are only those that are more than 65 percent black. And that just kind of stopped me in my tracks, but you can understand the logic, right? Because if you want black or white Democrats to be in the party, then because of the way that electoral politics, with collusion on both sides, which is crucial, uh, has, has come to be the fault line for, for a racial divide in South Carolina, because the Republicans and the Democrats don't disagree on anything. Except, which, you know, it's kind of like national politics. Uh, except, uh, as to, you know, how the, which, which people are on which contract lists and or what, what the order of, of, of the names is on contract kickback lists. The payoff list. But, but what that means, though, is, is that there's no, so politics then, or what people understand to be politics, in the um, electoral realm, on the side of both Democrats and, and uh, Republicans, black and, and white, it is all about race. And that's the only thing that it's about, right? Uh, and, I mean, everybody understands the coded language and the stalking issues, welfare, food stamps, right? <laughs> Big government. Uh, and, and then when one of the white Democrats does get elected in one of these black interest districts, then, of course, the concern is to make sure that they don't switch and become the Republicans once, once they become incumbents, which is the norm. But, but, but just think about this, and then kind of, you know, this, this, I think, speaks directly to the problem of the political project, right? And that, Karen, I think you're relevant. The thing is that insofar that, well, we don't have help from our allies, and by our allies, I mean, you know, the liberals in the Democratic Party, right? Uh, when, when was the last time that a Democratic candidate to national office uh, actually tried to address the working class, right? Or try to uh, or, uh, identify himself or herself with a clearly downwardly redistributed uh, program? Right? I can't remember. I mean, that, well, I mean, not since I've been old enough to vote. I can't think of it. Right? And that includes George, George McGovern, who just died. Right? Uh, so, and more and more, and especially since the Clinton wing, wing of the party won and was able to dissolve the DLC you know, into the DNC, uh, you know, what we've got is, is that kind of uh, ethnic interest group, ethnic slash interest group politics, right? That that that's actively directed away from uh, trying to pursue the kind of strategy that that you, you laid out, right? To an alternation between symbolic and expressive act activity on the one hand, bearing witness about some injustice, or the um, election cycle where everybody understands that, well, yeah, this is just about getting this marginally less stinky bastard elected, uh, but um, I'm over the other. So there's not even much much space for us to th think about pursuing politics anymore. But, as you implied in your question, and as you made clear, clear in the answer, I think that's how we've got to go. Other? Yes, here right in front. No, that'd be you right there. Oh, sorry. Thank you for your ideas. I have two questions, but before I ask them, I just want to try a summary to make sure I understand what you're saying by race graft. It seems that what you're saying when you use the term race graft is that the logic of racism is circular. Is that what you mean? That's part of it. And, and that you can't explain anything that is otherwise you can't explain anything that's held as an expression of race, in quotes, without using racist language or racist terms to explain it as racial. You can only end up where you start. You can only end up where you start, and circular. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, the two questions are this. 
you said? If I understand that racism is the practice of a double standard based on ancestry. Do you mean ancestry in a different way than national ancestry? For example, I'm Hungarian and I have a Hungarian ancestry. So if I don't like, you know, Swiss people, are you saying that that's racism? That's the, the first question. And the second question is that uh, Francis Cress Welsing, uh, a psychiatrist, has said that racism is a conglomeration of defensive practices that white people have amassed over time to prevent what she calls white genetic annihilation. And what she means by that is, to put it a certain way, if you shake up the population of the planet enough, without boundaries, economic, physical, etc., given enough time, the planet will become completely brown. Because most people, most human beings are brown females. So racism is basically a whole set of fences, psychological, industrial, economic, etc., to keep white people, a phenotype of white people, from being wiped out over millennia. So I was wondering what you think about that idea, as well as clarifying the idea of ancestry. Well, let me start with the first one. I'm not sure I'm going to tackle the Dr. Wilson's. <laughs> Well, I've heard the last of that a long time ago. Uh, but let me clarify this about ancestry, because I'm sure everybody in this room understands that ancestry itself is, is not um, a demonstrable category. Uh, some years ago, I read about a fellow who, uh, who said that he became enamored of genealogy. 13 or thereabout. He just he was so wild about it that finally his parents said, you go to your Aunt Fanny, whatever her name was, who was, was a big enthusiast for genealogy because she, she'll, she'll tell you everything you need to know about that. So under the auspices of Aunt Fanny, he went and um, they did the family tree and it took weeks. I don't know what people do when they do that, but they, they looked into all of his background. And he said, in one moment, that was almost an epiphany for him. And Fanny said, look there. And she pointed somewhere on the family tree. And she said, that shows that our family is related to Charlemagne. <laughs> and he spent several years feeling very chuffed about that. Oh my goodness, I'm descended from Charlemagne. Until he went to college and took a statistics course where in one of the lessons the guy was talking about very large numbers and he used as one of his examples numbers for the, the uh, your ancestors. You know how, large, how fast those numbers get very large. He said the number couldn't be that large if there weren't a lot of overlap going on back there somewhere. So then he said in almost these words, so that means that uh, probably everybody who's alive on the planet today is descended from Sean. <laughs> uh, ancestry is arbitrary. So when I talk about a double standard based on ancestry, we know that nobody can it, it impose such a thing on the basis of a rule that is scientific and consistent. Some of your ancestors always have to be left out of the way. We quote uh, a statistic that the anthropologist Stefan Palmi gave uh, that he estimated that um, there are probably more white Americans with African ancestry than there are black Americans with African ancestry. That's because, you know, Whatever people say and however they may attribute, this is my ancestry and not that, you know. By, you, you have two parents, but it keeps going up geometrically. Eventually, you know, you get to, to Charlemagne. So when I say that, all I mean is that we use a standard that's supposed to represent ancestry. And we were discussing here some of the ways that that's marked out, because it's not obvious. And, but that, standard uh, uh, 
that, that double standard becomes a practice around which uh, ideological assumptions that, are, um, that, that we characterize as racecraft are built. Now, as to whether you like another people who are Hungarian or something else, uh, we started out by saying this doesn't have anything to do with individual preferences or dislikes. It doesn't have anything to do with states of mind. It's social practices, and social practices are not something that an individual can do alone. So whether you like or don't like this group of people or not, this nationality, isn't really the point. Nobody could uh, create slavery by uh, their actions for one individual. So we're talking about something that's collective. I'm going to let somebody else handle Dr. Wilson. Well, yeah, yeah, I'm going to say a couple of things. One is, uh, you know, when, uh, um, in, in, I got into this as a research area, this race theory stuff, um, mainly because of two incidents that uh, occurred at the, in the early 1990s um, on two different Ivy League campuses in the span of three months. In each case, I was at a seminar with a group of very distinguished colleagues, much more distinguished than, than I, from the law school. You don't get much more distinguished than that. Uh, and uh, the philosophy department, political science, um, social political economy. Uh, first was at Yale. And I had two versions of the same conversation. First at Yale, and then at Brown. And the conversation goes... Did you say Brown? Yeah, Brown. Uh, because I was at, at uh, Brown because they were... Um, contemplating starting an ethnic studies program, and they brought me to do a seminar with a colleague. So, and the conversation went, went like this. Um, so I'm wondering, what's the difference between race and ethnicity? So in each case, since I was kind of new at this, I said, well, it's kind of like this. You can imagine like a continuum of okayness. And if you're a ground zero of okay, you have neither race nor ethnicity. <laughs> if, if you're kind of okay, but not completely, then you have ethnicity. If you're really not okay, then, then you're a race. And in each case, the response from the colleagues was, was identical. It was like, well, but there's got to be something more than that. And the next thing I knew, we had taken a turn, got in the Wayback Machine, and we're in the late Victorian era. Right? It was all this craft-like um, natural affinities. Right, so, and in fact, you know what, like I even used a Hungarian example. I said, so, if I'm a Hungarian, well, no, actually, I'm Polish. If I'm Polish, what well, if I have a Polish grandparent, and you have a Polish grandparent, I can somehow smell this, we can smell this in each other, and we, we, and we, we can bond with them. And they just wouldn't let it go, because they, because they thought there had to be something. And this, so I said, okay, there's something really bad here. <laughs> with, with respect, to Dr. Wells, and we actually um, we overlapped on the faculty for a year at the very beginning of my career. I mean, here, here's the problem. The, you know, the, this is a, it's an internally consistent story that she tells us, but it's like a version of the Yakub story, right? <laughs> because it's, it's an ahistorical story in the sense that it presumes the existence of precisely what it is that, that, that she is trying to explain, right? She assumes whiteness, but and it's a psychoanalytic story too, which is in this context. I mean, I know, you know I'm not as hard on that stuff as you sometimes think I am, Doc, but but in a case like but in a case like this, psychohistory is great for bad history. But um, <laughs> but so she presumes, so she takes the contemporary. Uh, racial taxonomy of the early 20th century, right, which, as John Jonathan Marx often points out, is really like um, one version of the biblical story of Noah and his kids, right, him and the others. What they say about Catholics is really true, you know me, but, uh, but uh, so, so I'm not that clear about the story. But she, <laughs> but she takes this taxonomy and reads it back um, ontologically, right, into the history of the world. Uh, and it doesn't take into account the, 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 the recency 
uh, you know, with which notions of race and represent as a metric or a discourse of human difference. Uh, and even the, the, the greater recency uh, uh, with, with which this uh, standard three to five group continentally based taxonomy that is the foundation of our folk understanding of, of race actually came into existence. So in the period that she's talking about, uh, which is you know, rough, you know, which is basically you know, the period of the transatlantic slave trade. The category didn't exist, right? Uh, I mean, most people in Europe didn't think of themselves as white even. And um, by the way, just since I've um, got a bug up my uh, self uh, <laughs> now, but I'll just go, 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 go and put this one out here too. Like, the you know, there's a cultural studies version of the Yaku story too. And it's the uh, racism emerged from notions of capital O, otherness, and the enlightenment, and presumably a road over here you know, behind the Mayflower, <laughs> and, and what was implanted in the New World, right? It's, I always make you think about, uh, you know, what was the Skip Gates tale about, uh, you know, the signifying monkey like an Asian guy swam from Africa, from Cuba. Uh, but, um, but um, you know, all these are um, origin stories, right? And they're stories, right? I mean, there's, there are stories in the same way that the Bible is a story, the same way the signifying monkey is a story. And so, so I would conclude by saying that, that the problem with Dr. Welsing's um, ontology is that it's, well, it's, it's like false. But that was true, too, actually. Um, in um, a black American political thought group that I've taught for a long time now, um, I had a week on cultural nationalist ideologies in, 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 the, in the early 70s, and it just had so much crap in it that um, I started um, pairing, uh, purging. And I had just cut the Welsing uh, press theory of color confrontation at Black Study, uh, uh, that um, Black Scholar piece, off, off the syllabus when I picked up the, um, uh, the New Haven Register and saw that Francis Press Welsing was giving the Martin Luther King Day address. <laughs> Uh, sponsored by the Black Student Alliance at Yale, so I had to dig the damn syllabus out of the trash and then have to go back to the basement. Well, let me, I said I wasn't going to say anything about her, but, but, but let me just say this because it, it uh, tags on to what uh, Adolf said. Uh, apart from the fact that these categories that she reads all the way back are recent categories, you also have to ask yourself if there's a mechanism here, when is the mechanism? How does it work? Do, do you have a, a, something inbuilt in you, programmed into you, that recognizes and tries to preserve these categories that are recent develops, developments in human history? And it makes me think, and I'm sorry to put it this way, but it makes me think of a few of my dog owning friends, and I circulate the dog circles, but I've had more than one talk to me about their dog's preference for other dogs of the same breed. <laughs> so what, what could the biological mechanism possibly be for a dog to recognize a breed that is wholly the, the product of human manipulation and about which the dog doesn't know But that's a question. Stop. That's, yeah. a question. that's a question. What? Whether the dog knows? Yeah, no, what you just asked is a question. It's not a conclusion, it's a question. Which is the question? Does the dog what is the mechanism? What is the mechanism by which a dog would recognize another dog of his breed and preference? Yeah, That's well, a question, but there's no, there's no, what's the answer? Well, my answer is that the dog does not recognize another breed because there, it's not a biological uh, fact. There's no such thing. And, and just who was it? She, Francis Welsing may, may say that if you just made it random, well, the truth is, if dogs made it at random, you'd end up with a generic dog, and it wouldn't have anything to do with the breeds. It doesn't have anything with the breeds now. We're the ones who do that. And to think that the dog understands it is, to <laughs> me, analogous to thinking that there's something inside of human beings that makes us want to preserve uh, a biological status that our biology doesn't know anything. 
Well, you know, just to take, you know, just to push that a little more too. Right? I mean, think about it. Right? Like the way that race science, like at the moment when race science had its moment, basically, its apogee, it was never possible to find a population, right? I mean, to find um, a population that clustered around the characteristic that was said to define you know, the race. So, what to do? What to do? Well, what the race scientists did was create ideal types, right? Create taxonomies in their heads. And then take the ideal type of an Alsatian, say, to the real people living in Alsace and measure them for the extent of their uh, putative deviation from this high, totally idealized construct that was just, you know, uh, I just said the chapter I'm working on now, that when you say race, you might as well say, or race with respect to science, you, you might as well say Sasquatch, yeah. right? Right, they're the same thing, right? Because you go looking for Sasquatch because you know Sasquatch it is there. Why? Because you know it. Because that's what folk ideology is. That's, that's what you know because you know it. Uh, and it's the same, and race is exactly the same, same, you know, same as Sasquatch. And I, mean, I mentioned that in my chapter because <laughs> if we saw it in the 20s and 30s, and we see it again, uh, in fact, um, I can't remember where exactly this is, I think it's close to the end of, of the race graph you guys mentioned, that, you know, the trope among the latter-day race scientists is that, you know, when somebody calls foul at having, you know, at, at, you know now the fashion is epigenesis, which is just uh, warm over the marketing race theory. Uh, but, but, but when somebody raises concerns about uh, the biodeterminist protocols, basically, and looking for, for like, because every time there's a new innovation, right, or a new technique, or a new particle, or a new discovery about a bit, bits of DNA, junk DNA now, is being revivified. There's a group of scholars who say, okay, now let's, let's, let's see if there's a racial difference, right? And the reason that they, you know, this just, uh, you know, this underscores the extent to which the commitment to race is an ideological and an ontological commitment because, uh, because the tacit presumption is, well, it's true that we couldn't find race differences before, but that's probably just because the measuring instruments weren't, weren't good enough. And so you know, now, we, you know, now we can maybe find them. And the people like us will object. I mean, then the response is, you're trying to stand in the way of science. I said, no. And see, this is when I think the Sasquatch sub substitution is quite, quite effective. So, you know, like if you spend all this damn research money, <laughs> what if I to go and find the Sasquatch, right, then people would have problems. I have, uh, I have a colleague who, uh, at the beginning of the semester, um, he's done this more than once, uh, because he's, he's teaching uh, medieval Middle Eastern, because that's his specialty, and he teaches a course on Africa, and he knows that his students come with um, certain unified ideas about it. So he starts by giving them something that uh, it's his way of, it's his reductio ad absurdum, but he does it straight faced. And he tells them every society has a plum constant. And the plum constant is a measure, and he tells all the factors that go into uh, uh, calculating this plum constant, which is a measure of civilization. And there's a hierarchy, and some have a higher plum constant than others. And, um, he, he develops this for maybe a third to a half of the lecture. And then at some point, he pauses and then he looks at them and he says, you people are writing this down just as though it weren't nonsense. <laughs> this is nonsense. You let me stand there to... Well, he told me that he had to stop doing it because one year, a student got very upset, more than one, and said, well, I believe in the fun constant. How can you say that it's nonsense? There is a plum constant. Ava used and repeated the word and, and said, how can you do this? So 
my friend decided, I, don't, don't, don't do things that depend on uh, irony being <laughs> understood, or that that depend on what that do. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you all. I'm sorry.